Hello. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, KSCCM. Uh, I'll be talking about acute brain injury in patients with ECMO. These are my disclosures. This is the outline for the talk today. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, prevalence of acute brain injury, ABI, in ECMO. And then we'll discuss uh, modifiable risk factors of ABI in ECMO population. And then lastly, we'll talk about the prevention and how to manage these patients when they have ABI. The use of ECMO has been increasing over the time. If you look at the mortality uh, from the ELSO, adult population, pulmonary 60%, cardiac 44%, ECPR 29%, this has been stable over the time, and we'll talk about how ABI impacts the mortality. Now let's talk about prevalence of ABI. The ELSO registry, the largest international ECMO database that's out there. If you look at VA ECMO patients, more than 10,000 patients, about 4% had ischemic stroke and 2% with hemorrhagic stroke. DV ECMO, about 16,000 patients, about 1.4% ischemic stroke and 3% hemorrhagic stroke. You can see that in, in the graph, uh, the trend is there, but it's not statistically significant over the time, 2013 to 17, but it's under 10%, uh, all neurologic complications or ABI. Now the caveat is uh, the ELSA registry, because of the lack of adjudication process, uh, the number is probably under estimation of true prevalence of ABI. Now let's talk about observational studies out there. There are two large meta-analysis papers on this topic. So if you focus on the first paper, the ECPR patients, over 6,000 patients, they reported ABIs in this population after ECPR. The weighted prevalence of ABIs uh, was 21%. Now the second paper looked at uh, VA ECMO patients, non-ECPR, and VV ECMO. This is over uh, 16,000 uh, patients. The ABIs in VA ECMO was 19%, which was higher than those in VV ECMO, 10%. Notice that these numbers are higher than what's reported in the ELSO. And I think really the ELSO registry probably underestimate the number of ABIs in ECMO patients. Now let's look at the brains after they die. The ECMO patients, this is a single center uh, institutional data from Johns Hopkins. If you look at the table on the last row, no neurological diagnosis, only 32% out of 25 patients. So meaning 68% uh, of these patients who died after ECMO support actually had ABIs. Uh, that's alarming. The second paper focused on hemorrhages. So we looked at uh, microbleeds, CMBs, and hemorrhagic stroke. And overall, 92% of brains actually had either CMBs or hemorrhagic stroke after ECMO support. And note that 60% were CMB. We'll get back to these uh, specific questions, uh, CMBs in uh, ECMO support. So what? ABI and neurologic complications are common. So now, what do we do about this? And what can we do to improve the neurologic care and outcome? Do we even care? We should care because mortality inc increases with ABIs. Uh, it doubles or triples the mortality when ECMO patients have ABIs. Now, the current practice is really reactive, not proactive. So we'll, we'll be talking about how to manage these patients and also what are the really modifiable risk factors for these patients. Now, the risk factors for um, ECMO associated ABIs, there are a lot of them. Uh, as we know, ECMO patients, the physiology is complex and they have a lot of complications, especially thrombosis and bleeding. Now, before ECMO, uh, there are a list of risk factors that can cause uh, ABIs. But there's nothing we can do about this. They got the ECMO because of this refractory hypoxia or cardiogenic shock. Or cardiac arrest. And all of those can cause ABIs. 
Now, but I want to focus on during ECMO. During the ECMO support, what can we do to prevent further worsening or new ABIs to occur? There are four things I want to highlight in this talk. First, microemboli and thrombosis, ECMO circuit clot, and ABI. And the second thing, hyperoxia and ABI, and neurologic outcome. Third, rapid alteration, especially the delta, reduction of CO2 uh, around the uh, ECMO cannulation time, how they impact ABI. But lastly, um, or lastly, not the least, anticoagulation and bleed. So let's talk about this each risk factor. Let's first talk about hyperoxia. Hyperoxia is more of VA ECMO problem than VV ECMO. We know that VV ECMO patients, uh, we have trouble with actually hypoxia and keeping the oxygen up. For VA ECMO, uh, hyperoxia alone or subsequent to weak perfusion of ischemic tissue uh, can cause ABIs. We know hyperoxia is really bad for the brains from translational basic science and also especially cardiac arrest literature. Uh, hyperoxia actually causes poor neurologic outcome. We have a lot of clinical papers on this. But if you look at VA ECMO population, we have no papers looking at uh, neurologic outcome in VA ECMO patients with hyperoxia. There's mortality papers. Uh, there are a couple papers looking at uh, high mortality with hyperoxia in these VA ECMO patients. It turns out we give high percentage of oxygen all the time, especially during the first hours after uh, VA ECMO cannulation, very commonly. This is, uh, of course, based on really tradition and preference, uh, clinical clinician's preference, rather than high quality clinical data. Now on the right side, uh, more than 10,000 VA ECMO patients from the ELSO registry, it showed that all subtypes of ABIs were more common in patients with hyperoxia as measured by 24-hour ABG, uh, which is a protocol uh, in the ELSO registry. We took this question to our single center database at Hopkins. Our question was, does early hyperoxia cause poor neurologic outcome? We looked at different parameters for hyperoxia. First, PaO2, mean 24-hour PaO2, max and max change in PaO2, and duration of mild, moderate, and severe hyperoxia, and PO2 area under the curve. Mild hyperoxia was defined as 120, and moderate 200, and severe uh, 300. And we measured the neurologic outcome by modified ranking scale, which is a standard uh, neurologic outcome scale in neurologic fields. As you can see in the table, each parameter, or most of the parameters, increase the odds of poor neurologic outcome in these patients by uh, MRS. The second graph, you can see that as you go up on the uh, severity of hyperoxia, uh, you're going to find that uh, patients will have uh, poor neurologic outcome. And it turns out uh, duration of hyperoxia was the strongest predictor for poor neurologic outcome. Patients with poor neurologic outcomes had longer exposure to mild, moderate, and severe hyperoxia in the first 24 hours. Now, this is just a retrospective analysis. Now, we need uh, multi-center studies to validate these findings, internally. And we need clinical trials uh, for these specific questions. The second risk factor I want to talk about is carbon dioxide. Of course, you, if you suddenly change the CO2 tension in the blood, uh, as, you, as we know, the vessels in the brain is very sensitive to CO2. It can cause vasoconstriction and potentially ischemia. Now, first paper, 7,000 VA ECMO patients, large reduction in PCO2 over 24 hours were uh, associated with ABI, odds ratio of 1.6. The second paper, uh, 12,000 patients, VV ECMO, same also registry, a large relative decrease in PCO2, more than 50%, had an increased incidence of ABI compared to those with a smaller decrease. And in the MV model, multivariable logistic regression model, after adjusting for cardiac arrest and high bilirubin and CRRT, it was still independently associated with uh, ABI. 
Now, I think VV acquisitions is really possible, and it makes sense uh, to have a large drop in uh, PCO2 after the uh, VV cannulation because ARDS patients are hypercapnic most of the time. But VA ECMO is hard to imagine that you have this type of large reduction of, uh, of PCO2. But data are data, uh, but we need more studies to study, uh, you know, kind of validate these findings, uh, maybe local registry and the multi-center studies uh, with the multiple ABG data points uh, to look at this question. Second risk factor I want to talk about is clot, especially ECMO circuit clots. We know ECMO circuit clots are common, and we don't know what to do about it. Now, um, in relation to ABI or ischemic stroke, um, we have really limited data on this topic. The table three, uh, this is uh, from the paper uh, that looked at uh, 10,000 patients with ECMO support, uh, VA ECMO support. Uh, the risk factor uh, factors for ischemic stroke included, uh, notably, ECMO circuit mechanical failure. This particular variable in the ELSO registry includes ECMO circuit clot. The OS ratio was uh, 1.33. Notice that uh, hyperoxia was also associated with ischemic stroke. So there is some signal that ECMO circuit clot uh, may be associated with ABI. Now, I want to introduce this case, uh, a young patient uh, who had a refractory cardiogenic shock, VA ECMO uh, cannulation, fem to fem cannulation. This patient, um, in, in Hopkins, uh, we routinely uh, monitor these patients with TCDs. When we did TCDs, uh, this patient had uh, showers of emboli. Each peak, and you can see the red arrow, uh, represent a microembolic signal in the brain. Uh, we monitored the TCD ultrasound uh, in the temporal window, uh, both sides 30 minutes. An A and B figure, you can see that uh, a lot of a lot of embolic signal, showers of emboli in this patient. The patient developed GI bleeding, pretty significant. We had to stop the heparin. Um, and uh, given that uh, this picture, the oxygenator actually showed arterial sided uh, clot, we actually switched it out uh, the oxygenator. And after that, subsequently the next morning, uh, Showers of emboli were gone. You can see in the figure C, uh, no emboli at all. So this case uh, really told us that maybe TCD can be used to monitor uh, emboli from the ECMO circuit. So now we are collecting the data. So tune in uh, for uh, the analysis. Uh, we are doing TCDs on all uh, ECMO patients to monitor this. The reason I think uh, TCD embolic signal and ECMO uh, circuit clot or ECMO generated clots are, is relevant is because of this. If you look at the meta-analysis paper, uh, in cabbage patients, uh, among 204 patients, uh, about 27% actually had silent brain infarcts when you do MRIs after the cabbage. So this particular meta-analysis looked at patients who had MRIs uh, soon after um, uh, cabbage. And clinical event is 2.4% uh, stroke. But even in cabbage, there are no studies with MRI and TCD association. Let's talk about a couple clinical scenarios where we can use TCD as a tool to monitor brain emboli. Now for the first, asymptomatic carotid stenosis, if plaques are unstable, you can use TCD to monitor emboli because this unstable plug will generate uh, the clot to shoot off to the brain. That may indicate that you should intervene on this uh, carotid stenosis, even though they are asymptomatic. If you look at the ESOS database uh, for cryptogenic stroke, the patients with cardioembolic source in the future, or when we figure that out, they tend to have more embolic signals compared to other etiology of uh, cryptogenic stroke. And if you monitor LVAD patients with TCD, there is a relationship between TCD embolic signal and ischemic stroke in the LVAD population. So based on this, uh, for VA ECMO patients, now we talked about hyperoxia and ECMO circuit clot. Uh, so I think 
In this conceptual framework, arteriocytic clot or ectomosarcic clot and hyperoxia both can lead to acute brain injury, either through emboli uh, that, that is detected by TCD or reperfusion injury from hyperoxia. All of this can lead to unfavorable neurologic outcome in ECMO patients. This is a reminder slide about bleeds and ECMO. Uh, we talked about also database uh, VA ECMO patients with 2.2% hemorrhagic stroke, PV ECMO 3.1% hemorrhagic stroke. And we talked about inst institutional database, how autopsy shows 92% of brains actually showed uh, CMVs and hemorrhagic stroke in ECMO patients. So given the high prevalence of uh, hemorrhagic stroke in ECMO population, neurologic monitoring may be the answer. Now let's talk about these two interesting papers. First one focuses on eCPR patients, 103 patients. Uh, they did a protocolized full body CT scans within 24 hours after eCPR cannulation. The reason for the cardiac arrest were detected in 17% of these patients uh, with the CT. Hemorrhagic stroke was 11% when they did the CT scan after eCPR. Now the second paper focuses on VV ECMO and ARDS. 250 patients with a protocolized CT brain scans uh, within 24 hours after VV ECMO cannulation. Hemorrhagic stroke was present in 16%. 16%. The author said uh, most of the hemorrhages were silent, but we know that uh, most of these patients are paralyzed or sedated. So neuro, neurologic monitoring is the key for uh, these patients. Routine CT scan showed 11% and 16% of hemorrhages in these patients. Let's talk a little bit more about microbleeds. So there are a few MRI studies in ECMO population. Um, so in MRI, we look for SWI and GRE scans sequence to look for hemosiderin or microbleeds in the brain. So these figures are all ECMO patients. So in Hopkins institutional data, when we did the MRIs, uh, about 60% actually patient had um, uh, microbleeds um, for the patients who survived. What are the causes for microbleeds or CMVs? Is it emboli, infection sepsis, antithrombotics? Is it ICO illness and inflammation? And continuous flow, uh, especially for VA ECMO patients with non physiological flow uh, without any pulses. All of these factors are uh, really hypothesis generating and uh, we don't really know what's happening to this brain. Now let's talk about MRI brains in LVAD population. As you know, LVAD is a long-term uh, mechanical circulatory support device. They have common risk factors as ECMO, but this uh, ECMO is a more short run and LVAD is a long run. Um, and uh, there are two studies that came out from Japan. Uh, one study, 35 patients, they did MRI shortly after LVAD was explanted. And in the MRI, 97% uh, of patients had CMBs. Uh, of course, they had no control group. And they subsequently, a couple years later, they followed up this study with the control group, uh, CHF controls. And the MRI showed Similar findings, uh, CMBs were 98%, much more common than patients with CHF uh, control. And um, they also uh, saw that cortical superficial siderosis was really common. Uh, those are really the markers of small vessel disease in the brain. So this is uh, pretty interesting and very consistent with the ECMO literature that we uh, I just showed you. It turns out not all CMBs are the same. This is a study looking at amyloid angiopathy patients using 70 MRIs and its correlation to brain histology. They found that CMBs can be either recent, old hemorrhages, or vasculopathy. Now we know CMBs are pretty common in ECMO population. Now what, what are we seeing here? Is it hemorrhages, recent hemorrhages, old hemorrhages, or vasculopathy? I think it's an interesting question to look at vasculopathy and endothelial dysfunction, especially ICU illness with the inflammation cascade and also continuous flow, non puzzle to flow. Uh, they all can cause endothelial dysfunction and small vessel disease in the brain. But further study is needed to prove that concept and also hypothesis. I want to discuss briefly about the cannulation strategy in BBECMO. 
So there's been a lot of interest uh, comparing double lumen and single lumen cannula for BDF1 patients. Two years ago, there was a study comparing 31 French and 27 French BVAC more patients, did a propensity matching analysis, and showed that uh, um, patients with 31 French had a higher risk of ICH compared to 27 French. There is a subsequent study from the same group, actually, double lumen versus single lumen uh, cannula, uh, using the same ELSA registry database. Um, and when they compared it, uh, this uh, in a propensity matching analysis, no difference was found in ABIs, including ICH. So it is conflicting, and I, I don't think based on this data, we can make a conclusion. But further study is absolutely needed uh, to answer this important question, because there is a biological plausibility, of course, uh, if you put the double lumen cannula, big size cannula, 31, 32 French, in the right IJ, of course there is gonna be venous hypertension and uh, possibly CBST thrombosis, and that causes uh, uh, a lot of complications in the brain. Uh, we recently had a case, a uh, 40-year-old uh, male with COVID-19 infection, ARDS, um, uh, who was supportive with, with VV ECMO. Uh, we put a, a double lumen a crescent, uh, right IJ cannulation, and the um, uh, patient has had multiple episodes of transient neurologic deficit, uh, facial droop, quadriplegia, uh, and the second event, a patient had paraplegia and auto, also auto mental status. We did extensive workup, uh, CT scans, blood work, uh, uh, spinal angiogram. Uh, only thing we found was in the venogram, uh, we saw a lack of blood flow in the right IJ with a loss of venous possibility, as well as really high pressure in the transverse sinus. Is it the cause? I'm not 100% sure. But I think it does contribute uh, when there is venous hypertension and congestion and there's a hemodynamic changes with the position or head turning, I, I think uh, that, can, that can cause a neurologic deficit. So more to come on this question. I want to briefly mention that uh, for the VA ECMO patients, especially fem to fem cannulation, the global brain ischemia can be caused by Harlequin syndrome. So fem to fem cannulation, uh, really, the upper half body can have differential hypoxia, and it's really important that we monitor these patients with NIRS uh, for desaturation and also the right radial line for ABGs. So what do we do at Hopkins? Uh, for all ECMO patients, uh, they get neurointensive care consultation. From day one, uh, neuro exam by a uh, neurointensivist, we do TCDs every other day or daily if there is embolic signal. And then day three to five, we start the sedation because we have a cessation protocol, except for the COVID-19 patients where we uh, paralyze and sedate for a long time. We place EEG if uh, GCS is uh, less than eight of sedation. And SSCP, uh, when motor GCS is uh, less than four. And then we recommend CT scan. And then we repeat the TCD. Of course, these patients are all on NIRS uh, for the oxygen monitoring. And after ECMO decannulation, we do neuro exam, MRS, and then brain MRI is recommended for all of these patients. For the eCPR patients, we start continuous EEG uh, from the day of cannulation for two to three days. When we did that, you can see in the figure, comparing ERA 1 and 2, before and after the standardized neural monitoring protocol, we improved the detection of ABI by 10%. And then we think we improved the neurologic outcome by implementing neurointensive care. Now this is a retrospective study and uh, uh, the data is limited. We have to validate this finding. But what happened was neurointensive care and then neural monitoring. So if there was a hemorrhagic stroke, we stopped the anticoagulation, be reversed if it is a large enough hemorrhage, and then repeat the CT scan for stability of hematoma and hemorrhages. And then careful resumption of anticoagulation was necessary, and neurointensive care team was following this patient all along. And then frequent neuro exam, and then we managed the seizure. For ischemic stroke patients, we pursued a large vessel occlusion and thrombectomy. And all of these patients, hemorrhages and ischemic stroke, they have edema. So we pay attention to these little details to manage the cerebral edema. 
head of bed, hyperosmolar therapy, paying attention to PO2 and CO2 changes, uh, temperatures, and also ICP management if uh, uh, there was ICP issues. This kind of strategy could really result in reduction of ABIs and improve the neurologic outcome. However, there are atmospecific challenges when you manage these patients. Their surge reaction is high and cardiac output is high and the fluid is shifting all over the place and volume of distribution is large with the ECMO circuit, which decreases the level of medications, the oxygenator membrane, PVC tubing, all of this increased the absorption of the drugs and it sequesters the medications that we give. So with these challenges, we have to pay attention to levels and how we sedate the patients and how we manage the seizure medications. So our sedation protocol follows the medication property. Uh, the medications that has uh, have uh, low protein bonding and uh, lipophilicity, uh, that's the medication we choose. Hydromorphone, ketamine, uh, if we have to do benzo, then we have uh, we choose uh, lorazepam. Uh, those are the medication that has a lower protein binding and lipophilicity. We know that fentanyl, propofol, they have high protein binding and also lipo lipophilicity. They uh, tend to get sequestered in the circuit. Uh, so we prefer those medication, hydromorphone, ketamine, and lorazepam. Um, for, as far as the seizure medication goes, we have no idea how to do this. Uh, I think we should uh, check the levels every day and uh, really learn uh, how to uh, give uh, anti-seizure medication uh, based on the levels they have. The use of EEG in ECMO populations is pretty interesting, I think. Now, we can use this EEG to monitor seizures, of course. Uh, but I think the use of EEG in uh, neurologic prognostication is an interesting concept. Uh, this has been tried in or studied in uh, cardiac arrest literature. Uh, there are so many li uh, limitations on this. EEG alone cannot really neurologically prognosticate the patients, uh, comatose patients who are not waking up. But I think it can be a, uh, a tool or complement other multimodal uh, monitoring tool and uh, algorithm that we can use to predict uh, outcomes in these patients. Uh, you know, there are a couple of papers on this topic, but I'm not going to really dive into this topic. But I think uh, we need to learn about this and we need to actually start monitoring these patients with EEG. So please uh, continue EEG on these patients. Uh, the monitor is needed so we can learn from the data uh, we have. Lastly, I wanna ask you a question. Do you use ICP monitor in these patients? Uh, certainly I have for the ECMO patients. Now EVD, BOLT, PVTO2, uh, it is possible to place these devices, but you have to stop the anticoagulation, heparin drip. Anticoagulation practice is uh, kind of varies in, in each center uh, for VA and VV ECMO. But I think this is very similar to those uh, with uh, CVST. So they get developed clot in the brain and then uh, venous clot, and then you start the anticoagulation. But they have a lot of ICP issues. So you have to stop the heparin or reverse it and then place the ICP and then resume the uh, heparin again. So, but you know, as we know, ECMO patients have a uh, much higher mortality than uh, patients with CVSD. So always a uh, careful multidisciplinary discussion is necessary uh, with the goals of care with the family. But uh, in emergency situation, I think ICP monitor should be pursued and considered. In conclusion, ABI is really common in ECMO population and it doubles or triples the mortality both VA and VV ECMO patients, only hyperoxia, ECMO circuit clot for VA ECMO, and only PCO2 change, especially for VV ECMO, are potential modifiable risk factors. And we need clinical trials and multi-center trials for this. Hemorrhagic stroke may occur only after ECMO cannulation. And I strongly recommend only head CT scan. So we can actually change the course of disease, uh, really managing the anticoagulation strategy. CMBs, very common, more than 60% in ECMO population. Etiology is unclear, we need further study. But CMBs have a long-term sequela, cognitive issues, and also future hemorrhagic stroke. Only detection of AVI through a standardized neurologic monitoring protocol with comprehensive neurointensive care may improve the neurologic outcome. 
Of course, we need further study, multi-center studies. We need to focus on these modifiable risk factors so we can improve the outcome for VA and VDA ECMO patients. I'd like to acknowledge Hopkins uh, ECMO research team. We have amazing people in the group. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you.